coming up on Turning Point International. I've never been sick a day in my life. How did I go from feeling wonderful to this? Welcome to the program. We're so glad you've joined us today. Now, oral tradition is a key part of the African culture. We'd like to start things off by sharing some of our favorites. This one is a Swahili proverb, and it says, wealth, if you use it, comes to an end. Learning, if you use it, increases. Now, speaking of learning, how much do you know about God? Is it possible to prove his existence? Find out the answer as Simisol Al-Kai has a candid conversation with the author of the book, God is Not Dead, Evidence for God in an Age of Uncertainty. Why did you feel compelled to write a book about the existence of God? Um, what caused this book to really come into existence was there's a singing group uh, that many of them go to our church called the Newsboys. So they had this big hit song called God's Not Dead and kids are singing God's Not Dead and so they're excited about it. So they produced a little video and they asked me to help in that and then other things like that. Next thing you know, they said, would you write a book? So I put this book out, wrote it mostly 2012 to help give the evidence for faith so that believers can really have the substance beyond their own experience. Many believers know God is real, but they can't show he's real. And so that's the goal is like 1 Peter says that you should always be ready to give a defense or the, the reason for the hope that's within you. So that's what I'm hoping God's Not Dead will do. Now for people who maybe they don't believe in God or they do, the question always comes up that, you know, if God is real, why do bad things happen? Why is there evil? So what would you say to those people? Well, I mean, evil and suffering is a part of the world. I think people want a world where they, they think they could kind of engineer a world better than God. They want choice. They want to be able to choose. But also, if you have the right to choose or the, or the freedom to choose, then there's going to be the option to do the wrong thing. So um, really, people want evil to stop happening you know, around them. They just don't want evil to stop happening through them. Rather than create robots, he basically says, look, I'm creating you for a purpose, but I'm going to tell you what, you know, here's, he defines evil, God does, he denounces it, he says, don't do it. But ultimately, he has a plan to remove evil, starting in the human heart, through the gospel, and then ultimately from the universe, which as it says in the book of Revelation, I saw new heavens and a new earth. So God is just as concerned about evil as we are, and he has a plan to defeat it, which is the, which is the message of hope we have. I don't want to be glib about it because if somebody talks about evil, there's two kinds of questions. Either they're talking about theoretical evil, trying to kind of blame God for the problems in the world. But if somebody's had evil happen to them, in other words, if you've been hurt, then I don't want to trivialize that because there is a lot of serious things. There's pain, there's terrorist attacks, there's famine, there's you know wars, genocide, and so none of that can just be glossed over. Uh, but really, the evil in the world is the manifestation. I would say it this way. The existence of evil isn't the evidence of God's absence in the universe, but the absence from our hearts. And so atheism doesn't, atheism doesn't take away the pain. It just takes away the hope. And so this is why we, when it comes to evil, we as believers have the answer. We can tell where it came from. We can tell its source, but we can also have a plan to say, here's how it's removed. Now, for people who want to, you know, share their faith and they want to be ready, you know, when people ask them a question, is, does God, is God real? Does he exist? Uh, I know you have something called a God test. Yeah, what this is, this is the God test, and this has been blowing up in Africa. Basically, we teach people the, the SALT principle. You start a conversation, you ask questions, you listen, just like you're doing to me now, you're very respectful, you're listening, and then you tell the story. Many Christians start talking, argue, get louder, and then they kind of kick people, you know. So that's the talk method. But we want to start conversations, and what the God test does, it asks the question, do you believe in God? And you can see all the different religions there. If they say yes, uh, that's side B for belief. If they say no, there's side A for a atheist agnostic. And so what we teach are a series of questions that draw the unbeliever out, or maybe the doubter out. And that's why we have to learn when our time comes to talk, 
we have to really have the answers and we have to study. Yeah. So. Now my final question, um, you are a pastor, you've started churches, you've written books. For you personally, what has been something in your life that has constantly told you that God is not dead? That he is indeed alive. You know, when I was when I first when I became a Christian as a junior in college, I didn't like Jesus. Jesus to me was a guy, a skinny guy with a sheep around his neck. I didn't want anything to do with it. You know, Christians like to kind of smack when they talk. Hallelujah. And so people used to come up, hallelujah. And they always would, you know, smacking and praying, you know, and I just thought, please, I would go into Christian meetings and everybody was smacking. Hallelujah. So I thought. But a guy got in my face without a tic tac and uh, a breath mint, if, if you don't know what that is, and uh, they don't have that brand there, but he began to preach to me about Jesus, and I really came to Christ as a junior in, in college. So I go back to the change. I mean, I can tell you scientific, philosophical evidence and the ultimate historical evidence of God becoming a man in Christ, walking on the earth. You know, you're talking about a science experiment. Jesus said, test me. He was tested again and again. So God couldn't have done anything more undeniable than manifest himself as a man and walk among us, be questioned. His miracles weren't tricks. Magicians do one trick and then they don't do it again. Jesus repeated his miracles because they weren't tricks. They weren't illusions. They were signs pointing to who he was. But the ultimate sign was his resurrection. And, he, and Christianity started in the very city where it would have been easiest to disprove, Jerusalem three days later. So I can go through the scientific, the philosophical, the, the, uh, the historical, but the ultimate thing, as I'm saying, is the living proof that uh, Jesus has changed my life, he's changed my family. And I think for anybody watching, you know, that's what we end up saying, hey, I was blind, but now I see. But I do think we can't just have the subjective experience as much as we can have that, and that's good for us. We still need to learn and study because I think our arguments and our evidence is overwhelmingly more powerful than the skeptics, but it's of no use if we don't know it. You know, evidence of God is everywhere. We just have to open our eyes to see it. For everyone struggling with the question, is the Bible true and is God real? We have more scientific evidence now than ever. If you want more information, check out our notes on Facebook. Well, speaking of Facebook, it's that time where we get our viewers' feedback. And Simi Solokai is here with one of your questions. Simi, what are the viewers itching about? Well, Moiwa, our question today comes from Maurice from Nigeria. And he asks, who is God referring to when he said, let us make man in our image? My question is, us and our. What do you think? Well, well I guess we believe in a, in a, a, a trinity. We believe in... God in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, rather like uh, I'm a human being with a body and I have a soul and a spirit. True. And, you know, I love, one thing I love about God is, you know, it says in the Old Testament that he's I am. So he's savior, he's healer, he's protector, he's so many things, but he's one. So I think that that pretty much answers it. Oh, thank you, Simi. After the break, the man behind the chart-topping song, I Give Myself Away, joins us live on Skype. You don't want to miss it. He's a recording artist who's touched the hearts of millions with his modern style of worship and unique sound. William McDowell is now stirring up a new wave of worship with his latest release, Arise. William, thanks so much for joining us. I am honored to be with you. Now, of course, we know you uh, for the song, I Give Myself Away and uh, I Belong to You. Uh, but I wanted to go back a little because uh, I gather you, you gave your life to Jesus at about the age of five. You know, that's my, that's my story because that's when I was baptized. 
but my earliest memory of life is actually when I was three years old, uh, trying to convince my parents that I was saved, uh, but they didn't believe me. And so they didn't let me get baptized until I was five. <laughs> and I'm not so, surprised they didn't believe you. My <laughs> three-year-old came up to me, I said, boy, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I remember because they, they wouldn't let you take communion unless you had given your life to Christ. And I kept saying, I want to take communion with you. I'm saved. And, and so that's my earliest remembrance, you know, remembrance of life. <clears throat> but I was baptized when I was five. And so clearly that's my public uh, confession and profession of faith. And uh, I've been walking with the Lord ever since. Now, of course, now we see you, uh, this great worship leader. Your, world, your songs are sung around the world. I mean, from Africa to Europe. Uh, but there's an, another point in your life that I wanted to find out about. When you went to, to I, we call it university in the UK, I think you call it college, where you tell a story about wanting to go to, uh, 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 I think it's at a party by, uh, sure. by a caucus called Alpha or, or something like that. And, <laughs> and you're, you're, you're going, you had your doubts, you're going and you have an experience of someone coming to tell you, actually, what are you doing there? Tell us a bit about that. Well, you know, it was really interesting. I mean, I, I, I utilized that as a point in my life to, to really say that that, I, I would say, would be a turning point moment in my life. Not that I wasn't walking with the Lord prior to then, because I certainly was, and, and serving God diligently and serving faithfully in church. Uh, but as you grow up, obviously, if you grow up as a, as a child of someone uh, or, or as a child of the church, so to speak, uh, you, there's always, you know, this question uh, in your mind of, of, of what is it like on the other side? Not that you ever really want to go on the other side, but, mm. you know, a, as a high school student, you kind of hear about, you know, college parties and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, the first week of college, I went to uh, get in line to, to go to this this college party that, you know, I've been hearing about <clears throat> all my high school years and how great these things are. And and, and I, I deliberated for quite a long time because certainly it's one of those things where I'm like, you know, I shouldn't go, or, but I'm going to go. And no, I shouldn't go, but I'm, yeah, I'm just going to go and, and see what it's like. And, and so I'm standing literally in line <clears throat> and no one at the university knows who I am. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know anyone. I went to a college where I, I didn't go with friends or anything like that. And so as I'm standing in line, someone who I do not know uh, comes up to me and says, what are you doing here? You should go home. And I, and I, I really was bothered by that. And I said, well, what are you talking about? Leave me alone. And, and, and so <laughs> time went on. I'm still standing in the line. And, and they say, no, really, someone like you shouldn't be at somewhere like this. And I, and I kept saying, you know, stop messing with me. Stop, you know, badgering me, so to speak. And they would not leave me alone the entire time. <clears throat> and so finally they said, no, you really should go home. Someone like you shouldn't be here. And I'm thinking to myself, you don't know me. And so I stood there the entire time, uh, determined at this point, that I'm not going to let this person uh, send me home. And mm -hmm. I don't even know. So by the time we get towards the front of the line, fire marshal comes and shuts down the place and says, everyone has to go home. Uh, and so I never <laughs> did get to go. Uh, and I turned around to find that person and they, were, they disappeared. Uh, and I never saw them again. I don't know who they were. Uh, and so I went back to my room, uh, my dorm room at the time. And I said, Father, apparently you intend on using me for your glory. And you don't intend on me being a part of these things. And so from that moment forward, I just kind of made a decision. You know, I belong to you completely. Wow. And uh, that, that would be a turning point in my life and my journey with Christ uh, because he visited me in such a powerful way. While so, I, so, so William, so the moral of the story is if you're going to have a party that doesn't include Jesus, don't invite, don't invite William because it'll get <laughs> shut down. It's going to get <laughs> shut down. <laughs> but um, so here, here we are. Uh, and I, I, I guess you can understand now where the lyrics uh, I've been captured by a love I can't explain come from. But you have a, a, a DVD that's uh, that's coming out in, in the works. And uh, I remember speaking to uh, Mary Alissi and people like that and uh, Martha Muniz, and they speak so highly of you. And I wonder, would your DVD include all these? Because there's a whole litter of artists who speak so much of you. Uh, but we don't know about. Well, I'm, you know, extremely humbled by the relationships and friendships that the Lord has given me over the years uh, that have just been tremendous blessing uh, to walk with people. 
behind the scenes and, and both known and unknown. Uh, this DVD will include uh, some great friends. Uh, Martha and Mary, not a part of this particular DVD, uh, but they're great friends. But <clears throat> Pastor Jason Nelson is a part of this DVD, and, and, and Stephen Deidre uh, Crawford, uh, who many people know as Anointed. And what well, depends on how old you are. Uh, some people know them as Anointed. Other people know them as the worship leaders at Lakewood. Uh, and then also my good friend B.J. Putnam is a part of this as well. And so I'm just really excited about the way that, that that was captured. But I think the thing that excites me the most is the fact that God himself showed up and it's obvious. Wow. So one final thing, our time is almost up. I wonder for someone watching who has desires of being like William McDowell, because of course, like it or not, you've now become an example uh, in Africa and Europe. They're looking at you thinking, I really want to be like him. What are some of your, give us three things that you will say, I'll tell you, Brother, sister, go away and do these things. Wow. Um, well, I don't think that, I mean, God has a specific calling uh, and a specific uh, gifting for everyone. You know, the scripture says he saved us and called us uh, with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according mm -hmm. to his purpose and his grace that he's given us through Christ Jesus. And so because of that, I don't think that anyone can, <clears throat> can be like anyone else. Right. Uh, I will say that uh, because God is sovereign, uh, ultimately he chooses. Uh, and so, and, and, and I make that statement rather than the three things. The reason why I make that statement is because ultimately, um, you know, you can, there's nothing you can do to put yourself in a position to do anything else other than to please him. Well, uh, William, just, just as well, you didn't say three things because we, we've run out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Ultimately, uh, live your life to please God and, and let him do the rest. William McDowell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. After the break, a young mother's life hangs in the balance. And I just kept saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. would like to book Muyua and River Songs for concerts, ministry, and speaking engagements, just call the number on your screen or go to riversongs.com. Welcome back. The woman in our next story was enjoying a quiet evening at home with her children. Yet in a matter of seconds, something happened that would turn a typical evening into a living nightmare. Take a look. I was fighting for my life and I was afraid. How could I go from feeling wonderful to all of a sudden, hold on, fight for your life, be strong? Treva Gordon was pregnant with her third child, a girl. But all her hopes and dreams for her unborn daughter turned to fear 37 weeks into her pregnancy. That evening we were watching television, having a wonderful time, and all of a sudden I experienced a pain in my stomach like never before. It was like someone had taken a knife and had stabbed me in my stomach. And I, it immediately caused me to drop to my knees in pain. My son, he ran across the street to get the neighbor, and the neighbor came. She found me on the floor. I'd never felt pain like that before. Treva was rushed to a local hospital where doctors diagnosed severe toxemia and several other life-threatening conditions. Her blood pressures were stroke level. It was very close to death. Her uh, liver hematoma was extremely large. Uh, it could have ruptured at any time. Uh, when they do rupture, uh, the mortality uh, for, for um, that event is extremely high. Treva's husband, Robert, was recalled from military service in Iraq to be with her. I was on a plane leaving within hours. When, when you hear something like that, first thing you want to do, you want to pray. Treva's liver and kidneys were shutting down. Doctors performed an emergency C-section and saved Treva's baby. But Treva's life hung in the balance. After two days in intensive care, 
with no signs of improvement, she was life flighted to Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville. It seemed as if there was a lot of chaos in the room, trying to get my kidney functions revived and, and working, and my liver functions had completely failed. And all I could do was just lie there and pray. I said, God, help me. I don't know what and what's going on with me? I've never been sick a day in my life. How did I go from feeling wonderful to this? Treva was placed on a dialysis machine and spent several more days in the hospital, in and out of consciousness. Friends, family, and church members gathered in prayer for her survival. Treva says she had visions that death was waiting across the hall. Prayer is what prevented death from coming over to take me. And he could not cross because of this white light. He said, as soon as this beam or this traffic of light stops, I'm going to come across this room and I'm going to take you. And I was so fearful and I just kept saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. When I walked in, it was a very desperate situation. The doctors had basically given up on her. That's when I realized that, you know, this was a make it or break it moment for her. And when I approached her bed, I just felt like the Lord told me, just go ahead and lay hands on her. You do what you're called to do and let me do what I'm here to do. When I actually woke up and I could really see my pastor was standing there in the ER room, I was so glad to see him. And he was praying over me. And I just felt the peace of God, that God didn't forget about me. And I was still fighting for my life but I thank God for the prayers. Treva slowly began to heal. Her doctors told her she was fortunate to be alive considering the severity of her condition when she arrived. They said many women come to this hospital in the condition you're in. And within five minutes of being in that condition, five minutes, they die right there on the table. And for you to have survived that, It's a miracle. I thank God for just being my doctor in a sick room at that hospital. I don't know why he allowed me to live, but he did, amen. After two weeks in the hospital, Treva was sent home for months of bed rest and kidney dialysis. I knew that I had to fight. I knew others were praying for me, but I had to pray. I began to read the Word of God and to stand on His promises. I read every scripture about healing, and I took that in. He says, by His stripes, I am healed. I surrounded myself with the Word of God. I became strong. God says, let the weak say that I am strong. I began to say, greater is He who is in me than he who is in the world. And I felt the strength of God come. Today, Treva is healed and healthy. She says it was God who brought her through. Her daughter, Robin, is a perfectly healthy little girl. God has restored my organs. My kidneys are restored, my liver functions. No more high blood pressure, hypertension, none of that. I am healed today. I am a miracle. Whatever the situation is, trust in God and believe God for it. Believe God for it. And it may not happen on that day when you want it to happen, but continue to believe God for it and just trust in God and God will put you through it. Treva is very strong in her faith and I think that played a significant role in her healing. She had a lot to live for. I'll never be ashamed to tell what God has done for me because He has set me free. I should have been six feet under, but now I'm taking the gospel of Jesus Christ and I'll tell it wherever I can tell it that God is good. You know, Treva asked the question, why did God allow me to live? And I wonder if it's because of you watching now, you, Sally, you, John, uh, that you're so precious to God that he allowed Treva to go through what she did so you can get this message that God is with you. Listen to these words from Psalm 46, verse 1 and 2. It says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquake comes and the mountains crumble into the sea. 
So when all that happens, call out to God, he would answer. And we call out to him by doing a simple thing we call a prayer. So let's pray together. God, I hear you are a hiding place and a refuge and you can give strength in a time of trouble. I've seen what you did for Trevor. And I really want to ask you to help me right now where I am. I'm at the end of my strength and I know nothing else to do. Help me, Lord. Bring me out of this. Give me a new life, Jesus. I pray today. Amen. Well, we're almost out of time and we want to leave you with some music to uplift your spirit. Here is William McDowell. Goodbye and God bless. I'm